this every week thing. I just might as well get used to it. Can you hear me? What about? Oh, this one's off. Can you hear me now? Tim, you can't get mad at me this week because I had to turn it on rather than turn it off, which is what I usually do. I got in trouble last week. That's okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Masham Baptist Church. Thank you for coming out. I hear there's a big event going on tonight, but uh, I only found out yesterday, and uh, I guess I guess this morning, because Duncan here is wearing his colors on his chest, it shows how little I care about sports, because I said up until yesterday, not on my radar at all. So I will not be watching the Super Bowl tonight. I have no horse in the race, so you can't get mad at me for going either way. That's a win, right, Dennis? All right, do we have any birthdays or anniversaries today? Carmen. 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 No, 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 no. Carmen. All right, no birthdays or anniversaries. Dennis? Good morning, everyone. All right, announcements. Children's uh, church students, what'd you do? Wait for Where? Where? On Sunday. Yes. And what do you wait the teacher to do? Lead us. Lead us. Yes. Who's your teacher? Mr. Ah, uh, me again. Yeah. Yeah. Don't make that face. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fun. We have a good time. Yes. Okay, now we're gonna have pray yeah. We're gonna have play practice after morning service. Uh, then on Wednesday the fourteenth, we're gonna have a all invited fellowship meal from six to six thirty. And then we're gonna have break off into a youth, children, and adult Bible studies at seven. On the same day, we're going to have play practice again next week, right? Okay. Then we got the Camp Leader Retreat, March the 9th. Where's Colleen? Ah, oh, Peter not doing good. Yeah, dang it. Okay, yeah, bummer. Okay, then we got the Easter program, uh, March the 24th. All right. I'm checking with Roseanne because so, she knows all. <laughs> all right. Anybody, anybody else got anything you want to say, talk about? All right. Ooh, let it be loud. Okay. Today, this week's quote is, A little faith will bring your soul to heaven, but a lot of faith will bring heaven to your soul. Dwight L. Moody. I like that. All right. Let's stand and greet one another.
choir. I would love to have a choir up here with me this morning. Remember, it just says in Scripture, make a joyful noise. Just know that you're pleasing the Lord. It's good to see each and every one of you here today. If you will stand and turn to page 334 if you want to use your hymnal or look at the screen and you can see the words. Blessed Assurance. We're going to sing Rock of Ages, page 342. Somebody told me they wanted this old song, didn't you? I like this song. I, like this song. I know. No, I was just teasing because I was last Sunday. I really love their song, Rock of Ages. Didn't know they were singing it the next Sunday.
it. Uh, at one church, uh, some people came and were in the church, and the young kids or teenagers hadn't heard any of the old songs, and they were just stunned how much of the gospel was in the old songs. Turn to page 187 in the garden. <clears throat> Joseph, that's how he made it to all that time in prison, was that he was talking with God and he could feel his presence.
on up. Let's tell you. All right. Come on up and have a seat. Amy, I know your name. You do know my name. Do you know there's somebody else that knows even your name and my name and everybody's name? You know who that is? Jesus. Yeah. Yes. Jesus is in our hearts. Jesus is in our hearts. Yes. All right. So in my bag today, I have something, and I bet you all made something similar at your house. Can you guys see what I have? You're hidden back behind there. You're not going to be able to see. Come sit out here so you can see. I have a squishy squashmallow stuffed animal. Squishmallow, squashmallow. I'm old. I call it different. I don't know. But it's cuddly and it's fun. Actually, this is Michael's. I had to borrow it today. But it's pretty fun, huh? How many of you have a, stu a stuffed animal that you have that you like? So when... When you are scared or when you're sad, do you ever get your stuffed animal and you just hold it and you squeeze it and you love it and, oh, you just don't want to let it go because it makes you feel better? You ever have that? I mean, I have that, too. Like, sometimes I just cuddle it with my pillow because, you know, I'm trying to fall asleep, too, and it just feels good to go to sleep with it. But your stuffed animal helps you feel better, huh? So, do you want to know something? And this is something I want you to remember. As you're cuddling and squeezing, if you're sad and not feeling good, and, you know, this week is Valentine's week, so we're all talking about everybody loving and happy and, and things. But, you know, when we're sad, God gives us a big hug, too. So as we're hugging our squashmallow or whatever animal we have, do you know what? God knows that you're sad too, and he wraps his arms around you too. So you may not see him doing it, but if you feel really hard, you might feel that extra little something. And that's Jesus saying he loves you, and he wants to be there for you when you're happy, when you're sad, when you're scared, when you're angry or mad. God's always there for you, okay? So let's say a prayer and get ready to go to class, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for being there for us, no matter what our emotions. You're always there, Lord. And, and you know, Jesus came and died for us. He understands those feelings. And, and just thank you for that. Thank you for loving us so much that you sent Jesus to die for us. Um, give us um, the strength to carry on this week, Lord, so that we know that you're around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, go line up on the bench. We're doing a special this morning. Get over here. <laughs> We're gonna sing 10,000 Reasons. And ladies, you can sing that from where you're at, if you're out there and you know the words. The words are gonna be on the screen anyway. They better be. <laughs> we'll just all be standing here. Okay. It's been when we've been practicing. It's 
That's last week's sermon. I think I forgot to drag it into there. Some people's pastors, honestly. What are you going to do? Go ahead and open your Bibles to the book of 1 John. That much at least is right. Uh, We will be in chapter 1, looking at verses 5 through 10. Well, the title of the message this morning if it was on the screen, is Hubcap Christianity. And I just want you to know, I see the rest of the creative juices on that sermon title, so I hope you're not expecting anything. And here's why. So years ago, back when I was still building fence, I was at Taco Bell one day eating lunch. And we had this old, beat-up, red Dodge work truck in the parking lot. I mean, if you, the, this thing had this big dent in the side of it because my boss backed the skid steer into it. This thing was ugly, right? Like, it didn't matter what you did to this thing. But me and my brother, we're sitting there eating lunch, and all of a sudden, this lady, this talk walks in holding our hubcap in her hands. And I look at her, and I'm like, what in the world, right? And she's like, I hit your truck. And so we go outside, and I bend over, and I just hit the hubcap back on the wheel, and I'm like, oh, don't worry about it. Have you seen this thing? I don't even care. Her, her bumper was all scuffed up and all that stuff, but we didn't worry about it, right? And so I think sometimes we Christians, we like to think about God like that. We think, oh, God's just an old beat-up work truck. It don't matter if I sin and rub up against him and knock off his hubcap. There's no damage done, right? Not true. We're going to look at our text this morning that when we, if you will, this is a little cringy, but anyways, if you knock off God's hubcap by sinning, he takes offense to that. That causes us to walk in darkness, and so I just want us to be careful that when we sin, we understand that there, is, there are consequences. There's a gravity to it. There's no damage done. So, 1 John 1, 5 through 10. If your body is able and your spirit is willing, please stand for the reading of God's word. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you this morning for those who have come here so they can worship you, so they can hear your word preached, Lord. I pray that you would just use this time of worship to help grow us closer to each other, but more importantly, grow us closer to you. I pray that you would just be with me this morning, that you would Humble me and that you would give me wisdom and discernment that I might glorify you in all things. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. You can be seated. So my Taco Bell story, that's a funny story. Maybe it's not. But it's one that represents a not funny reality for those that reject the life-saving message of the gospel. Our text this morning is going to paint for us a picture of God's character and His nature. That God is light, and in God there is not an ounce of darkness. I mean, after all, light and darkness do not get along well with each other. They have no fellowship with one another. What does light do if not dispel the darkness? If God 
being light, in his infinite, which means we cannot measure God's holiness or his justice, if he was to come upon a person that was walking in darkness, what do you think would happen? I mean, apart from his graciousness, just like the darkness vanishes when you turn on a light, so too would that poor soul walking in darkness. Our text this morning presents something of a dilemma for those that would utter phrases such as, you know, it doesn't really matter how you live, you just need to love God and he will take care of the rest. On the contrary, John seems to be saying that there is a certain expectation, even a command, for Christians to live like Christians. We are going to read three conditional statements in our text this morning. And John, he's either imagining things that a Christian might say, or maybe these are three things that he heard or read. But these three things... Or if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie. If we say we have no sin, and the third is if we say we have fellowship, or if, if we say we have not sinned. John pretty much covers the full extent of what Christians or someone who claims to be a Christian is going to say in relationship to sin after salvation. So the main idea of the message this morning is this. If Christians desire to have fellowship with God, and we should desire that, then we have to acknowledge and confess our sins to God. Our first point this morning is that God himself is the standard by which we must guide our lives. This is from verse 5. So I imagine that everyone here is familiar with one of our, colloqu our colloquialisms, which just means something that we say here in America. Have you ever heard the phrase, only God can judge me? And this is a really popular saying. I see it all over social media. I hear it among my friend groups. You hear it at restaurants. You see it on signs. And I'm not sure how long this saying has been around, but I remember hearing it as long as I've been alive. Now, what's interesting about this statement is that theologically, there's nothing really wrong with it. I mean, at the end of the day, when it comes to our souls, God really is the only one that can judge us. But the problem is this. People usually use this as an excuse or a license to sin. You can have someone that claims to be a Christian and yet lives a life that would make even Jezebel herself blush. It's as if somehow being judged by God is better than being judged by man. And this is sad because these people do not realize what they are saying. And friends, it, it, it would be a terrifying thing to find yourself in the hands of an angry God. It is much better to be judged by men. Why? We can hide our sin from our fellow man. But when it comes to being judged by God... There's no hiding anything from the Lord. So the worst mindset that you can have is that it's somehow better to be judged by God because God is light. So this idea of God being light should be understood to be talking about God's nature, who He is, and God's character, what He does. Within God, there is not an ounce of deceit. There is not one blemish, stain, mark, or sin on God's character. God is perfection itself. When Moses asked to see God, what did God tell him? Moses, if you were to look upon my glory, you would die. And so Moses hid in the shadow of a rock, and he caught, I mean, just the minorest, the smallest glimpses of God's glory. And even that much was enough to make Moses' face shine like the sun. And so we ask ourselves, why would looking upon God's glory kill Moses? Because God being described as light, it can be understood as talking about God's glory, what's called His Shekinah glory. It is the same kind of light that the shepherds witnessed from the angels when they proclaimed the birth of Christ. 
It is this kind of blinding, all-consuming light that is God's glory and is part of His nature. This means that God, being light, not only will not have fellowship with darkness, but He can not have fellowship with darkness. On the other hand, think about plants and grass. Think about your garden. These things require light to grow. So back in our house in Elk City, we had these two big trees in our backyard. And what happens when you have grass under trees? It doesn't grow. And so under these two trees, I had these two huge circles of dirt. And what inevitably happens to dirt, especially when you have a son named Matthias, who likes to play with the water, is that this dirt turns into mud. And what happens to mud on the feet of little children and your dog? Well, it finds, your way, it finds itself into your house, and then you get in trouble by your wife for not wiping off the dog's feet. And so began my battle with trying to get grass to grow under these trees. But you have to understand something. I'm a city boy. Now, I'm a little more country now that we've lived here for three months. But back then, five years ago, I was about as city as they came. I didn't know anything about growing grass. I didn't even know what kind of grass seed to buy. So I asked my neighbor. He said to get Bermuda. I know now that you do not plant Bermuda grass under a tree. But I planted Bermuda grass. It didn't grow. I did a little Googling like us city boys like to do and found out that you plant fescue under a tree. And so I plant fescue. It began to grow, but then my children and my dog, the same ones who carry mud into my house, trampled my fescue seed, and it died too. But that's a story for a different day. So the positive side to God being light, for those that love God, His beloved children that walk in the light, we are nourished like the garden, like Bermuda grass in the sun by basking in God's light. We need the sunlight, or we will wither and die. And so then we have to ask ourselves, well, that's all fine and good, Pastor, but how do we walk in the light? I mean, if you're anything like me, I remember sitting through many a sermon where the pastor sits up here and he says these really good things, but then he doesn't give us any practical ways to actually go do those things. And so that brings us to our second point. We fellowship with lights on. And it wouldn't make a very good fellowship meal if we couldn't see what we were eating, would it? So as we turn our attention to verse 6, we see the first of these conditional clauses that I mentioned. If we say we have no fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. One thing that is important to note at the very onset of this letter is that John is under the assumption that it is Christians, or at least professing Christians, that are uttering these statements. He does not have in mind the lost when he's discussing these things. So in verses 6 and 7, John introduces this idea. He compares these sayings, the difference between, on one hand, we have walking in darkness. On the other hand, we have walking in light. So John is not talking about a leisurely walk down the street, This is not walking your dog, although if you were to try to walk my dog on a leash, it would be a struggle. Um, So this word walk, this conveys the idea of intentionally ordering your life in a way. So in essence, John is saying that if we say we have fellowship with God while we are intentionally ordering our life around sinful things, then we are a liar. But if we intentionally order our lives around good and godly things, then we do have fellowship with one another. We talked about this a little bit last week, but John brings it up again, this idea of fellowship. To have fellowship with God means more than just being associated with Him or coming to church on every Sunday morning. So fellowship is a word that means a, to have a deep sharing of things in common via association or participation. This also means having a relationship with God. And to have a relationship with God is to have intimacy with that person. It's more than merely a head knowledge. So in other words, 
If we say that we have a relationship with God while we are walking in darkness, we are, in essence, saying that God is okay with us living a hypocritical lifestyle. And John is going to say that, hey, if you do that, you're a liar and you do not practice the truth. So then we have to ask, what does it mean to walk in darkness? Do we have to be perfect to keep from walking in darkness? Thank God we don't, because if we did, I would be in big, big trouble, church. So to walk in darkness involves sinning. And you can think of it like this. Think of it like sin that happens in the dark. Sitting in the dark with your face in front of a computer screen, watching, you, watching things you know you shouldn't be. Going out for a night on the town with someone that's not your spouse. Sitting in a dark casino, gambling all of your money away while you have $30,000 in credit card debt. I mean, obviously, this has in mind more than sins that happen in the dark, but the image is clear. We know when we're sitting in the dark, when we're out on a dark night, that this is something that is not right. My old boss, Jerry Cannon, love him to death, but he used to say, there's nothing that happens after 10 o'clock at night that you can pray in the bout and the good Lord will give you permission to do. Now, I'm not sure I completely agree with that statement, but the point is, not many good things happen after the sun goes out. So John says, if you're walking in darkness, you lie. But John is not here saying that living like this necessarily means that you are not a Christian. But he is saying that living like this breaks our fellowship with God. And he offers the solution in verse 9, but we'll get there in a moment. For now, John wants us to understand something. Because God is fundamentally light in his nature and in his character, he can have nothing at all to do with sin. Which is why claiming to have unbroken fellowship with God while living in sin makes you a liar. But then John holds out, like John always does, he holds out a gospel thread. He says, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of his Son cleanses us from all sin. Much like we looked at what it means to walk in darkness, now we turn our attention to what it means to walk in the light. Psalm 119, 105, we all probably know this verse. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. See, this is one of those situations where I memorized that as a kid. That's why it was quoted in King James Version. Mm. So what does it mean to walk in the light? Well, we have to walk according to the Bible because it is God's word that illuminates our path so that we can see where we are going. We are intentionally ordering our lives in the ways that the Bible teaches that we should. And while we may sin far more than we like, our heart posture is to love God and to commit ourselves and our lives to living in such a way that it's obvious when the world looks at us, it's obvious that there's something different with us. I mean, think of it this way. If I was to take you and stand you in front of a house that you've never been to before, and I was going to tell you that in this house there is a treasure, and you need this treasure because if you don't find this treasure, you're going to die. But here's the catch. Inside the house, it's pitch black. You cannot see your hand in front of your face. But you know good and well if you don't get in that house and stumble through that darkness, you're going to die. What are you going to do? You're going to go inside that front door and you're going to stumble through that darkness and you're going to try to find that treasure. And that is how the, lo the lost live their lives in God's world. They live in the dark, completely blind to the thing they need to save their lives, completely unaware of the danger that they are in. But this is where the good news comes in. So let's say that the owner of the home comes home he, he learns of the danger and the distress that you're in, and he's merciful. So he restores power to the house, and he turns on the lights. Well, all of a sudden, you can see what was previously hidden. 
And so now you can see all of the obstacles that you stumbled and tripped over, and so you begin frantically to search the house. And you then see a door that previously you missed. You open the door, and there in plain sight is the treasure that will save your life. That is exactly what the Bible does to our lives, church, when we walk in the light. We stumbled in the darkness before walking in the light. And while at first, even when the lights are on, we stumble more than we should, eventually, as we live our lives as Christians, as God sanctifies us and makes us more like His Son, we stumble less into the treasure that has saved our lives, salvation, the gospel, Like I said, you do not have to be perfect. It's not as if the lights come on and you're never going to stumble in sin again. You're going to fight against that your entire life, and that's okay. That's part of being human. But what's important is you just have to keep pressing on towards the goal. I mean, after the lights come on, I have to imagine that that coffee table that you stubbed your toe on You're not going to walk up to the coffee table and kick it on purpose in the light, are you? That's pretty much what intentionally sinning as a Christian does. It's like saying, hey, I know I shouldn't kick that coffee table, but you know what? I'm going to do it anyways. It's not smart, church. Our third point this morning is there is no hiding our sin from God. So as we move into our third point this morning, I'm going to give you two quotes from two different teachers, and then after I'm done, I'll tell you who said them. But before I tell you these quotes, I want to preface it by saying, one of my jobs as your pastor is to lead you away from false teaching. And part of that is going to be naming false teachers, some of which you might like. That's okay. You can get upset, and we can talk about it after church. But let's just say this way, we just finished 2 Timothy on Sunday night, and I'm not going to do what Paul did. Paul says, hey, Alexander the coppersmith hurt me, let him be anathema. He's going to say, I turn him over to God for God to do with what he will. All right, so here's the quotes. Here's the first one. I am not a sinner, that is a lie from the pit of hell. That is what I were, and if I still was, then Jesus died in vain. I didn't stop sinning until I finally got it through my thick head that I wasn't a sinner anymore. End quote. So that was the first quote. And here's the second one. For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. So the first person is saying that they're not a sinner anymore. And the second person is saying that they are a sinner who struggles with the remaining evil that is inside of them. I mean, who are we to believe? Who's right? You're probably familiar with the second one, right? That was the Apostle Paul. So who do you think the first person is? It's Joyce Meyer. I know she's popular. Uh, I know the ladies especially probably love her. And so the notion of me calling her a false teacher might upset some of you. But she is. And our text is clear. If you say that you do not sin, you're a liar. And the truth is not in you. Not only that, to say that you have no sin, John says, you make God himself a liar. I mean, some commentators look at verses 8 and 10, at kind of the little differences between if we say we have no sin compared to if we say we have not sinned, to be talking about our sin nature versus our very act of sinning. But what's important is that even as Christians, we will still sin, We still have a sin nature. But the main point of this is that making God a liar is a very serious offense. And this is a blasphemous offense. This is the worst kind of offense that you can possibly imagine doing. 
And so why does it make God a liar to say that we have not sinned? It's because the Bible says that all have sinned, that all fall short of the glory of God. And to say that you have no sin is to say that the very word of God is wrong, but you are right. But here's what's important. Tucked in between these two negative verses is verse 9. This is the gospel. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What does it mean to confess something? You know, I know we live in the year 2024 where people like to redefine words and we get to make up our own meanings for our words, but the, we don't do that in the church, right? So this notion of to confess something, the word confess means to acknowledge the reality of something. So if I was to say... I don't want to, I got to think about this. If I was to say a false statement, like let's say, if I was to say Bob has a beautiful head of hair. <laughs> mm, I'm sorry, Bob. I'm sorry. That's not a confession because if you look at this poor man, you can see the lights reflecting off of his bald head. Right? But on the other hand, if you were to take an atheist who does not believe in Jesus, does not believe in God, and he was to say that Jesus is Lord, but without believing it, that's not a confession. You need two things to make for a confession to be a confession. Number one, you have to believe it. Number two, it has to be true. So let's take the sinner's prayer as an example, right? The sinner's prayer, I was saved by the sinner's prayer. The sinner's prayer is a tool, though, and we have to use tools properly. So what happens at a revival or at church camp when you have a bunch of emotional, emotionally high teenagers that just heard that, hey, if you don't turn, you're going to burn. You need to come forward and repeat a prayer. So what happens when they come forward, they repeat the prayer, but they don't believe the prayer? That's not a confession of anything. That's a lie. Amen. So our text this morning is saying, if you confess with your mouth, that means you have to believe it, and you have to say it, or it's not a confession. So salvation, it's really easy to become a Christian. You have to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, which means you have to believe it. And then you have to repent. What does it mean to repent? It means to turn around, turn around from your sin. It takes both of those things to become a Christian. You don't have to understand all of the little tidbits of theology Although those are important, you just have to believe that Jesus is who he said he was and repent from your sins. Amen. But that's not simple, right? In order to come to an understanding that you are not as good as you think you are and to really believe that Jesus is Lord, there's some conflict between our sinful nature and the truth of the world that we live in. But here's the good news. After that point... The gospel thread, while we still struggle, we read this. God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And not just that, he cleanses us from the stain of sin. So when you aren't faithful in God or to God, you can trust that God is faithful to you. When you commit an injustice or an affront to God, you can be sure that God is just. If you are in Christ, then your sins have already been paid for. They have already been forgiven. So when you commit an injustice to God, He is not going to get upset with you and look at you and say, I take it back, you're going to hell. That would be an injustice on God's part. The sin has already been dealt with. So John is saying that there is no injustice in God. God will never take back your salvation. Nothing will ever remove you from the hand of our Savior. So when we feel the stain of sin and the conviction that the Holy Spirit brings, when you feel the shame, that shameful feeling, when you feel dirty after committing a sin that you can't seem to break away from, remember this. God is faithful 
And he is just. And he promises to cleanse you from the stain of sin. Even when you don't feel like God is faithful and just, it doesn't change that reality. The only thing that you have to do is confess and repent. I already told you to confess is to acknowledge the reality of a thing. To repent is to turn away. So if we honestly feel conviction, if we see the damage that our sin causes, then we do not purposefully go back into that dark house and walk through it with the lights off. We walk in the purifying light of God, and sometimes when light purifies, it hurts. But on the other side, when we come to know God and we have a relationship with Him, when we walk in fellowship with God, then repenting of our sins becomes our natural response. It is the only response for what business does the darkness have with the light. Friends, perhaps this morning you find yourself being described in our text. Maybe you've been stumbling through a dark house, searching for the life-saving cure of the gospel. And good news for you. The owner of the house is home, and he has restored the power. If you're already in Christ, and the lights are already on, but you have to open your eyes, or the lights do you no good. If we close our eyes because of sin, then the lights being on do us no good. If you're sitting here this morning, and maybe you realize, hey, I've been in church a long time, but I've never actually walked in the light, only darkness. You've been wandering this world without a clue as to what you need to do. You are constantly in a state of uncertainty. Your anxiety is through the roof. You can't even remember the last time that you smiled. God holds out the promise of salvation for you. Peace, joy, love. Will all of your troubles go away? No. But God and His Word are the only two things that have answers to your troubles. Come to Christ. Feel the love of the Son that suffered and died the death that you deserve. And if you come to know Christ, then you walk in fellowship not only with God, but with those of us here at Masham Baptist Church. And I think I can speak on behalf of this congregation and of the members here that we promise to love you and support you through all of the messes that life will throw at you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for the life-saving message of the gospel. Thank you for not leaving us to wander alone in the darkness, Lord. But thank you for your grace and your mercy for sending your son to live a life that we never could and to die a death that we deserve. Thank you for raising him up again and bringing him to heaven where he serves as our advocate. I pray for those here who do not yet know Jesus in a saving way that you would just convict them of their sins, that you would open their eyes and give them ears to hear. I pray if there's anyone here this morning that has backslidden in their faith, Lord, that they are a Christian, but they have been walking in darkness, that you would drag them into the light so they can have their fellowship with you restored. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation. I'll be standing at the front. If you want to come talk to me or come pray with me, I would love to do so.
go ahead and remind you again about play practice after church. Uh, no running off. Mind you, she has a particular set of skills you can't hide. Well, thank you for coming out this morning. It's always a blessing to worship our Lord. Go to the world, tell somebody about Jesus, bring a friend with church to the Bring a friend to church with you next week. There we go. You are dismissed. <laughs>